Hello and welcome to episode three of our three-part series. Uh, this is New York State of Wine, The Elements, where we explore elements most integral to the wine regions of New York, earth, water, and wine, which we'll cover today. Uh, this, is, this seminar will uh, focus on the experimental side of New York wine and how producers are using their ingenuity to advance the industry. So some of you will have received tasting kits um, with these wines to taste along with the panel. So I hope you have your wines ready and we will cue you when we will move on to the next wine. Before I hand it over to our host, um, a few housekeeping notes. I'd like to point out that there are two communication methods available to you, our participants. Uh, we have a chat section and then a Q&A section. So the chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants. And the Q&A section is where we'd like you to submit your questions to be answered during the webinar. Uh, this session is being recorded and we'll share the recording um, following the session. So our host today is Jamie Good. Jamie Good is a London-based wine writer who is currently wine columnist with UK national newspaper, The Sunday Express. He is also the author of the book, Wine Science, as well as writing. He also lectures and judges wine. And he joining Jamie is our panel. Uh, we have Ian Berry from 680 Cellars in the Finger Lakes, Maria Rivero Gonzalez of RGNY Wine in Long Island, and then Mario Maza of Maza Chautauqua Cellars um, in Lake Erie. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Jamie. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session. As usual, the the kind of the the, the star focus here is. Um, not necessarily our chat, which hopefully will be informative, but it's the wines. Um, we've got six really interesting wines. And we've got a little diversity as well in terms of the representation. Um, we have um, between these six wines, we have um, three different um, New York wine regions represented. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll start with the wines and um, we're going to start in the North Fork of Long Island um, with Maria. Mar Maria, you. I guess there's not many people who have um, two wineries, one in Mexico and one in New York. Can you tell us a little bit about um, your family and the winery um, and the, the, the two wines that we're going to start with as well? Sure. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you for, for having me. Um, I think in, in general, as you said, it's um, not common for a family to have different regions. And, and these are more underdog regions in, in the world of wine, I guess. But we, we consider ourselves farmers first and foremost. We, we like to uh, grow grape and that's what we really know. So you can grow grape in a lot of different regions in the world. It's been very interesting because we came from Mexico where we've been doing this for almost 25 years. Uh, it's a microclimate, it's super dry, you get um, high pHs, very big, bold wines, and then we come to a cool climate, which is completely different, um, which is getting more game in the world, in the scene right now, because it's cool climate, and, and we all know how that is going with global warming. But so we come to uh, the North Fork, which is very humid, and we have to understand what that means in grape growing. So it's been very interesting to us to um, adapt to the region, especially in terms of winemaking. You do great grape Sauvignon Blanc, for instance, is one of our best wines. And uh, it's a grape that really does well in the North Fork. And then you start playing around with what you can do in winemaking as well, right? So, yeah, so we've, got the map, we've got the map there. So you're on the, the North Fork is that the little top bit. Um, where green port is highlighted there at oh, the bottom bit the north forks right yeah yeah so it's the, the, bottom the red bit. one yep the red one and so that's you're surrounded by water there presumably is that that what creates the humidity yeah and um and also as you go as the roots go in deeper you also have uh, more more sand in the soil as well so uh we've been as, as i said we're farmers and we try and do uh, as much as we can in the farm. Uh, this year it's been very interesting because we've been experimenting with biology, adding more um, 
more biology to the land and letting those little mushrooms work their magic. It's something that hasn't been done a lot in in winemaking. I mean, in, in grape growing, it's been Can done you in coffee. A bit more about, explain a little bit more about that, because this, this sounds really interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, so the premise is that before there, there, there used to be a lot of fungi working the, the ground, right? And the way they communicate is they communicate all throughout themselves above, below the ground. And so you should let the good ones and the bad ones work their magic between them. But what we do instead, if we kill the bad ones, then we're also, by killing the bad ones, we're also killing the good ones with fungicides. And so we're then the main reason why the fungi live for plants is they make all of the nutrients soluble. So mm. when they're not soluble anymore, there's no nutrients. So now we have to add nutrients to it, right? So we've been adding nutrients and killing fungi instead of letting fungi kind of do the whole cycle. Mm. So what we're doing now is reintroducing this biology or this fungi into the ground and trying to let them work without adding any fungicides and without adding nutrients to the ground. It's a long-term process. This is the first year mm. and we're excited to see what happens. No, this is really cool. This is very regenerative. I think this is very exciting, you know, allowing all the mycorrhiza to work and, and yeah, because the, the one thing that kills off mycorrhizae is the, is using um, soluble fertilizers because the plants, w without the soluble fertilizers, the plants actually release nutrients into the soil to let the fungi grow more so the fungi can get the nutrients for the plants. So it's, yeah. We've been saying, killing the cycle, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. very interesting. And what's the climate like? So we talk about a cool climate. Um, the winters presumably don't get very cold. It's not like the Finger Lakes. Um, but what are the summers like? The summers are, are hot <laughs> and humid. The main mm. problem we have is we don't get enough sunlight throughout the year. So mm. the pHs are low and then the humidity is catching up to us. So all of those diseases that come with the humidity are going to start showing up. So the key is you have to harvest early. So in harvesting early, we've kind of developed, we've adapted to the region into understanding what we can do with, from a wine making perspective that's successful. So grapes mm -hmm. like Sauvignon Blanc make a lot of sense. Uh, sparkling wines make sense because you harvest early and you have all of that freshness that you need. Rosés make sense. Uh, even we've been even experimenting with some orange wines. Um, and then if you, reds make sense, but from a lighter standpoint, and they're beautiful and they're complex and they're fruity, but they're not complex or bold, like mm -hmm. you would expect in a different region, right? Yeah. And your brand is RGNY. Is that, is that um, kind of like an attempt to make wine kind of more contemporary and accessible with you know, that sort of branding? Is that the... Um, are you looking to cultivate the younger consumers or... Yes, just for sure, for that? sure. So R, R is, uh, stands for Rivero, which is my father's last name, and G stands for Gonzalez, which is my mother's last name. In Mexico, we usually carry two last names. We're weird like that, I guess. So uh, the RG is really just standing for our family. And uh, we also have the Cielo brand. Cielo means seven in Spanish or sky. And we add an extra S to, it because, S to the word because we think we have super um, special skies or heavens. And uh, the label is actually a circus to go up to heaven. So we're definitely talking to, a, a, I don't know if a younger crowd, but I would definitely think a, a more out of the box and, and not very traditional crowd with those vibes, right? Yeah. Um, obviously, Ian and um, um, Mario, I'm aware that, that we're kind of like focusing on these, um, on, uh, you're kind of out of the conversation at the moment, so I apologize for that, but we're going to come to you very shortly. Um, just in case your thing is that uh, you're being ignored, you're not. I'm very aware that we are coming to you, but uh, we've got the first two wines come from you, Maria. So I thought it makes sense to kind of look at those um, wines. So the first one is the um, Cielo Sauvignon Blanc. Um, have we got the technical shot, the shot of that, so people can see what the label looks like? I think Katie's got that to share. Yep, that's that's the staircase to walk to heaven. Yeah, very cool. Um, so you have to finish it though to get there. All right. <laughs> tell us a little bit about the um the wine itself. 
so this wine um, is a hundred percent Sauvignon Blanc, no no oak, no aging. It's really meant to be taken fresh. And uh, to us, it's really we really want to demonstrate what the land can do here. So um, Sauvignon Blanc is is a very good expression. I think it's um, it's a beautiful in between those very greeny Sauvignon Blancs and those that are very minerally. I think this one has uh, a little more in the middle. It has some greenery to it, but it's not so um, impactful. Uh, but it, it's also a little more round, I want to say. Uh, it stays nice and fresh, very crisp. It goes amazingly well with all of the food that we have in, the Long, in Long Island, oysters, um, seafood. So it's, uh, and I think it's a very important it's very important to us to show that that we as a family can do also very conventional things, but that are done very, very well. So I think this is more towards that, the, doing a conventional thing that, that focuses on minimal intervention and land. How can we intervene the least? Yeah, I love the focus and the freshness here. That acid line is really pristine. I think that just drives everything and all the flavors kind of sit on top of the acid line. And that it's, kind it, of, it, yeah. it has a high note. But yeah. then it's it's also uh, more towards uh, passion fruit and, and those things that are not very yeah. needly, as someone is pointing out here. Yeah, lovely, really nice. And it's bone dry as well. But, um, yeah, and pH 3.28 is in the bottle. So kind of low, not, not, it can be, the, some of them can get lower than that, but that's just in a really nice place, I think. Really good balance. And I love the yeah. fact that it's um, less than 12% alcohol. It's really cool. Definitely a region with, with low alcohols. Yeah. So Viognier, um, how's it growing Viognier in um, Long Island? Is it is Hard. it easy to cut or is it tricky? <laughs> Viognier, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know about um, you guys, Mario, and, and any of you also carry Viognier or you have somewhere or you've seen, but it's it's very capricious. You're you're seeing it there and you're like, oh, we're maybe two weeks away. And then next day you will wake up and you're like, oh, I need to harvest now within two hours. This is ready. You you never know. It has that that personality, which makes it exciting, I guess. Um, not for everyone. I, our vineyard manager sometimes just wants to not have it anymore. But it's a very elegant expression. And I think it's a grape that's not being used enough for... Um, the beauty that it carries. It just, it, it's a wonderful wine that is not a junior wine. It's more of a senior complex wine that can hold on to a lot of uh, different things when you pair it. Mm. And I love the expression. I like the, the fact that it's recognizably Viognier, but it's quite a chiseled expression of Viognier. You've got all those flavors, you know, that you look for in Viognier. I think if we're tasting this blind, we might well get to Viognier, which is a good thing, because I think sometimes Viognier's can be a little bit compressed and they, they've lost some of their character. But at the same time, it's got that sort of Long Island freshness, 12% alcohol, good acidity. I think I'm really quite impressed with this. Um, yeah. How I do love you it. And I, sorry. I was going to say, how do you manage um, the two harvests, though? Because you're, they're both northern <laughs> hemisphere harvests, Mexico, then New York. Um, do you, do you, do you, are you present for both, or do you? Do you I I try them? to be. Yeah. I try to be, but to be honest, I I I I'm a firm believer on getting people that know more than you in in the very specific the various specific activities. So uh, I, we have a wonderful team in both geographies. And that's really helpful. Now, I'll say this. We're harvesting earlier and earlier everywhere, but we end up harvesting in July, end of July in Mexico, and we harvest here in September, October. So I have time. Yeah, I love I love that, um, the flesh and that Viognia. It's got, it's, it's really distinctive. It tastes the way the grape should taste, I think. it's got a And it has a beautiful permanence. It stays with you yeah. for long, yeah. which is nice. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah, so let's um, take a move now, and and we're heading to um, Lake Erie. Well, we're not with this next one. This next one's actually Finger Lakes, but um, Mario, you're based in Lake Erie, which is uh, I think this is the first time we've travelled down to Lake Erie in this series. Um, tell us a little bit about 
first of all, your region, Lake Airy, what's special about it, um, and also your own um, family business as well. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jamie, and thanks everybody for joining. So um, we're we're based along Lake Erie. Uh, if you were to zoom out a little bit further on the map of the eastern U.S., you'd see it's one of five of the Great Lakes. And the Great Lakes are the uh, you know some of the largest uh, freshwater bodies of water in the world. Um, Lake Erie happens to be uh, the shallowest, uh, second smallest, and uh, also the shallowest. Um, all of them were formed by glacial recession. And so that really impacts uh, our growing region, um, as well as also the, um, the um, uh, impact with regards to uh, uh, climate. So, you know, the buffeting effects um, that we see from the uh, winter, with we actually get quite a bit of um, freeze on the lake. This year, a little less so. We're seeing that sometimes less now than we used to. Um, but then also, uh, um, the impacts on the uh, geology as well. So you have uh, an escarpment and about a two or three wide, wild, mile wide growing region all along uh, this region. It actually spans three states from New York, west through Pennsylvania and even into Ohio. So um, it's a unique uh, American viticultural area in that regard that there's not many that span multiple states, but um, very similar growing uh, uh, conditions, I guess, across that. So um, we've been uh, making uh, wine along the uh, along the shores of uh, Lake Erie for uh, over 50 years in my family uh, in New York for nearly 20. And within Mazda Chautauqua Cellars, um, as Jamie mentioned, we have a wine uh, today, one from the Finger Lakes and one from uh, Lake Erie. But we actually bring in fruit from around different regions throughout New York State. And uh, that's kind of one of the... Uh, um, uh, I guess unique aspects, um, whereas Maria um, family is growing uh, quite a bit of fruit. We actually only grow a small amount of our fruit, but work quite closely uh, and very long term with uh, a number of growers um, throughout different uh, states and regions, some of them going back 40 and 50 years. Um, in fact, there's uh, fruit while we're not tasting it today. We've been buying uh, fruit from Maria's family and from that farm for um, probably about uh, 12 to 15 years now, and we really enjoy the the long term relationship we have with those that are that are great stewards of the land and um, and growing some wonderful fruit. Is most of um, um Lake Erie the is most of the um, the grapes there for table grapes? So they're um... yeah, so that, that's actually the the largest portion of the fruit. So uh, if you consider the whole AVA, all three states. There's over 35,000 acres of grapes grown. So it's actually the largest contiguous growing region east of the Rockies in the US. So quite substantial amount of viticulture there. However, uh, Jamie, as you point out, a lot of that does go into uh, juice uh, and uh, food production. However, there are still a significant number of acres and, and a decent percentage um, that now is, is continuing to move into wine. And we see more and more uh, of that with additional wineries opening up uh, throughout Lake Erie and more acreage getting uh, converted. Um, many of the growers that we partner with are maybe third, fourth, fifth generation families that have been growing um, here for many years. Um, but maybe only recently in the past 10, 15, 20 years have converted some of their acreage into um, wine production and varieties uh, more suited for that. Yeah. And so can you grow vinifera um, in Lake Erie or is it mostly um, hybrids? I mean, the winter low is the big challenge there. Yeah, winter is challenging. So, but there is quite a bit of vinifera grown here. Um, things from Riesling to Grunerveld Liner to uh, Merlot uh, as well, Cabernet Franc. However, um, very site specific in terms of making sure that you're picking a site that is going to be um, uh, accommodating of that. Uh, there's more winter tender varieties that um, you know just very difficult to grow here. So, for instance. You know, whereas Sauvignon Blanc can uh, can grow uh, out on Long Island, um, maybe other varieties like Petit Verdot, those are too winter tender to grow uh, for us here. And in some instances, um, later ripening reds also struggle because uh, mm -hmm. we don't necessarily have as long of a as long of a growing season. So for the wine, the first one of your wines we're going to try, we're actually um, heading to um, Finger Lakes. Yes. So the Nut Road um, Riesling. Right, so this is uh, from uh, the west side of Seneca Lake, uh, Martini Vineyards, um, same family of uh, Anthony Road Wine Company. And we've been working with uh, fruit from uh, Martini Vineyards for probably about 20 years now. Uh, and so we have a great relationship with John and Peter and the family. And 
block of fruit uh, ever since actually um, uh, the first fruit was uh, harvested a number of years ago. Um, we're pouring uh, a little bit um, uh, older vintage here. And I think what's neat about that is it just shows and highlights the capacity for Riesling to, to age and develop and, um, you know, express itself in, uh, you know, um, this evolution. Um, so, you know, very, uh, very developed in kind of those secondary uh, developed characters, some fusel characters coming through, but still nods um, to that, you know, driving and balanced acidity that, you know, really starts out with that wine, but uh, helps carry it through um, of age uh, in a few years, you know, the bottom in this instance intentionally. That's really, um, really impressive that this is five-year-old wine, five and a half years old, still got freshness. And one of the things I love about Riesling is that as a variety, it's, um, you can drink it young and it's delicious. Then you can drink it when it's in its teenage years and it's delicious. And then you can drink it when it's mature and it's delicious. Whereas so many wines, you come to them and people say, well, this would be fantastic in five years time. Or, well, this, this would have been great five years ago. This is a Riesling has its this drinkability all through its life and it develops in, in positive ways. And this is, and also what I love about this is the, the price point is fantastic. Um, so $16, um, really, um, Great value for money. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it, I think it's just fun to watch these wines evolve. Um, uh, we had uh, a little bit of fun last year. We did uh, a very intentional day uh, where we did a lot of uh, live between three and five vintages of quite a few wines. And this was one of those that was fun to pull uh, several vintages, same vineyard, uh, and just to watch and, and, and taste those wines side by side to see how they've evolved over time. Yeah, fantastic, um, great. Um, so, um, Ian, I think it's your turn now. And very, um, uh, uh, the keen eyes of the observers will notice that behind you, um, you have quite an interesting vessel of Elevage. Looks like um, some Italian terracotta to me. Maybe I'm wrong on the origin. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing um, and also the, the, you know, the way that you've really focused on alternative era of Elevage, which I think is really, really interesting. Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> excuse me, this vessel in particular is a, a sandstone jar, which uh, comes from, from France, not Italy in, in this case, although we do have some, some Italian vessels kicking around here as well. Um, so, um, basically here at 680 Cellars, um, we are... Um, under the parent company of Robbins Vines, which also owns Buttonwood Grove, which is about a half a mile north of here, and um, also a newly acquired vineyard about a half a mile south of here. So we're, our, our estate vineyard is kind of in the middle of those two properties. And when the Pittard family who owns Buttonwood Grove acquired this property, um, I had already been consulting for them as a consulting winemaker at Buttonwood Grove for about eight years at that point. And when we required this property, we, we really you know, started the discussion of what, what we want to do here and how we want to be different from, from Buttonwood Grove. And um, one thing we kept coming back to was all these cool vessels that we'd been seeing for years at trade shows and, um, and tasting wine from, from other regions in the world. And you know, the, the winery owner and myself were both kind of fascinated with um, with these vessels and with um, thinking about what they could bring to Finger Lakes wine. So, um, you know, part of part of what we do here is really kind of try these these different things, whether it's the uh, sandstone behind me or these uh, flavors here on this rack. And um, we have some uh, terracotta over there. You probably can't really see that, but um so we're we're really trying to match um, match the wines with the vessels. So it's really you know kind of a kind of a slow process, you know, like like everything in winemaking, you get one one chance a year to figure out um, what might work. And um, you know, in addition to that, we're we're really taking a low intervention approach to winemaking, um, just letting everything ferment with indigenous yeast. And uh, go through malolactic with you know indigenous malolactic culture, and um, you know no no acid additions, no sugar additions, um, uh, you know unfined, unfiltered for the most part. 
um, et cetera. And are you working with um, a range of different varieties as well? Obviously, Finger Lakes is best known, I guess, for Riesling, Chardonnay, Cabernet Franc, maybe some yeah. Noir. Do you other things as well? Yeah, we're we're you know we're kind of developing a focus here on um, Gruner Veltliner, Chardonnay, and Pinot Noir are going to be really what we what we focus on at 680. Um, this is only our you know we're coming into our um, third vintage here, so we're still you know relatively new and we're still very experimental. Um, in our vineyard here, we have uh, Gewurztraminer, Chardonnay. Uh, six different clones of Pinot Noir. We have Chardonnay, um, quite a bit of Riesling, and some Bordeaux varieties as well. Um, so we kind of view the Buttonwood property and this property and our new property as all one estate. Um, so we, we are pulling some, some Pinot Noir and Chardonnay from the Buttonwood Vineyard, and we've sent some Riesling from this vineyard up to Buttonwood. So, you know, we kind of kind of share between the, uh, the properties. Mm. And a lot of us, just a little side note here, a lot of us have seen the very concerning news about the frost that happened um, recently um, that hit the finger legs quite hard. Um, what's the situation? Have you been affected by these? Uh, yeah, we've definitely been affected. Um, it's it's really interesting, and it, you know, by by all accounts, it really is very site specific. The the frost damage or the cold the cold damage, really. I don't know. I think we're referring to it as frost damage, but it really was you know very very cold temperatures for 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 hours. You know, oftentimes the the frost will be kind of this this brief little little window, but this was. Um, you know, a clear night, a still night and cold temperatures. So the cold kind of settled in. Um, so between the three sites that we manage, um, it seems like our southernmost site got hit the hardest. 680, where I'm sitting right now, got the, the most minimal damage. It didn't go unscathed, but, um, but you know, really feel like we dodged a bullet here. And then Buttonwood Grove up the road also, you know, is kind of block by block um, how the damage is there. It's, um, you know, but throughout the region, I'm hearing anything from from completely unscathed to 100 percent total loss. So, um, you know, we're we're probably among them the more fortunate as far as how we fared through it, but definitely not unscathed. Yeah, very concerning. Such such a late time to have frost as well. It's a yeah. Yeah. But um, back to the wines. Um, the first of your wines, which we're going to taste now, is the um, Sandstone Chardonnay 2021. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this? Sure. That wine is all from our estate here at 680 Cellars on the west side of Cayuga Lake. Um, vines are about 15 years old. Um, this particular wine we machine harvested. Um, sometimes we like to machine harvest in the in kind of the wee hours, of the morning, so that we can get the fruit in nice and cold, and all at once. So it went right from the machine into the press, um, settled overnight in stainless steel, and then we racked it into this um, thousand liter sandstone um, jar behind me, where it fermented uh, spontaneously. Um, Let's see. The sandstone is interesting. It's it's more porous, of course, than than um, stainless steel, but it's it's only about a quarter as porous as a as an oak barrel. So you do get like a, a very slight um, micro ox that happens from it. And I, I, you know, I believe that the kinetics of the vessel also uh, the shape of the vessel also kind of helps with the ther the fermentation kinetics and kind of keeping the yeast in suspension and um, you know, almost self-stirring as it as it ferments. Mm -hmm. um, so after fermentation, it just sat on the leaves for about nine months, and I, I stirred the leaves by just gas mixing it from the bottom um, uh, a couple times a week as it aged, and uh, bottled, unfined, unfiltered. So it's really it's pretty natural then. This is this is um, this is stayed is. in the vessel it fermented in, presumably. Is that what you're saying? So you stayed in the gross leaves for nine um, months, yeah. and then you. Yeah, wow. exactly. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, we do we do use a little bit of sulfur at Crush and um, a little bit of sulfur before bottling, but um, but it is all indigenous yeast. It, it did go through malolactic spontaneously as well, um, and um, yeah, very very hands off winemaking really. Mm -hmm. And it's the, the wine's really distinctive. It's got this texture. It's got this um, almost a little aniseed character to it. I think it's really intriguing. Maybe a little hint of green apple. But um, yeah, not sort of like a, a typical barrel fermented Chardonnay character. It's um, very much about the fruit and then the texture that presumably comes from that, that sitting on the leaves for so long. Yeah, I feel like you get the texture from the vessel that you would from a barrel, but without, of course, the um, the overt, you know, yeah. oakiness from it. Um, and, Maria, uh, do, you, do you use any yeah. um, alternative elevage? Like do you, uh, or do you do things in, in stainless steel or barrels, or do you, do you use anything we else? Use, we use a, a little bit of everything. Yeah, we use amphoras actually, the, the, really huh? similar to those. Um, and uh, that, that's where we've been trying out uh, these orange wines, mm. and uh, we do it in Mexico as well. And mm. um, we've been doing it longer in Mexico, so we know a little bit of, about it. Um, uh, I think it's always fun to experiment. I think. I mean, Chardonnay can be 10, 20, 35 different wines. And that's where all of this matrix becomes very interesting for us people that are in the wine business, right? Because you can play around from the clone to when you harvest, how you harvest, to actually what vessels you use. So yeah, we've been experimenting. We also, uh, we, we ferment some of the red wines in barrel for a few months as well, for a few weeks to see how those develop in texture. Um, do you like them, Ian? How, are you liking the the clay, or 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 do you like more other vessels? Um, you know, honestly, I, I when we purchased all these vessels, we really thought that we would find some duds that we didn't want to deal with anymore, and 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 I don't know if it's fortunately or unfortunately, I I haven't found anything that I don't like so far. Um, we do have terracotta, which is extremely porous. So you have to be really careful with that one um, and really picky about what you put in that. So, so far we've, um, I did a Chardonnay in it, which maybe got a little oxidized a little quicker than I wanted to. Um, so we've kind of moved to just aging um, an Apossimento Cabernet Franc in that, which, um, you know, gives it kind of a slow oxidation, almost like a tawny port. So we're finding that that's really really a great fit for the terracotta that we have here. Um, that sounds fun. Yeah, that you have to be careful for the VAs, right? Because they can whoo, yeah. go and yeah, say it really sure. fast with those yeah. vessels. Yeah. But also sure. you you can play around with the native yeasts a little better, I think. Yeah, I, th I, th I think so too, although we haven't done any cultured yeast in them, so I don't really know how to, how to compare. Um, Mario, do you do anything um, a, a bit crazy do you use strange um um things to ferment your wines in or are you more a stainless steel sort of guy no we're we're, we're on the on the fermentation side of it, we're, we're a little bit more traditional in terms of um you know stainless and uh you know a little bit of use of oak although a lot more neutral uh combination of oak just to kind of let the fruit show a little bit more through uh through those wines here on the east coast so your real craziness is the varieties you work with, I guess. Well, not crazy. That's a that's a wrong term. But yeah. uh, for many people who are used to vinifera varieties, to coming across um, varieties like the one we're about to try, it might be, um, you know, just a little different. You know. So the next yeah. one is is the um, the perfect rosé, and this is actually from Lake Airy Fruit, and this is Chambersin, Yeah. Yeah, this is, um, you know, this is a variety. So we we do work with, so while there are a number of, uh, you know, vinifera varieties that we're working with being grown in the region, we also work with both uh, Labrusca and hybrid varieties. And um, I think what what's really fun is to hopefully showcase how wonderful some of those wines can be that are often, um, I think, Maybe less so in in regions that have them in the mix already, and I would say that's a you know at least a chunk of the you know eastern and midwestern part of the U.S. But sometimes they get cast with a you know kind of a negative light. So Chamberson, 
uh, has been around for quite a while and uh, a lot of um, uh, you know red that was being made with it for a number of years I came back into into the operation and I was you know honestly generally uninspired by Chamberson um, for red wine making um, especially here Long Lake Erie later ripening uh, hard to you know in many years to really bring it to something that I think um, at least that I that we we thought was uh, you know uh, worth bringing forward. And so quite a few years ago, we started a rosé program and I, you know, along with, you know, a number of the team members now um, have really fallen in love with uh, Chambersen to, to make rosé. Um, so, you know, uh, a pressed, uh, you know, a provincial approach with regards to um, bringing the fruit in, a lot of challenges with timing that harvest. Um, and, uh, you know, during this time, um, Maria, I don't work with Vionia. I don't work with Vionia in the U.S. I've worked with it elsewhere, and it is one of those like, oh, yep, got to pick it. It has that super narrow window. Um, Chambersen for rosé really has that kind of narrow window because mm. if you have, um, you know, nice weather in mid-October, early mid-October, suddenly you can go from wine that has the acidity, hasn't picked up too much color, to, um, you know, the inkiness in Chambersen can come on quite quickly, and it's very difficult to um, strike that balance of that delicate rosé that we're trying to uh, trying to achieve. But I, I love the fruit that it brings. I love how high uh, the acidity is able to retain for us, which was always a challenge from a red wine making perspective, but I think is just an amazing asset with regards to rosé. And so it's really about taking what we're growing here, what makes sense and aligning that with style rather than trying to force the style on the, on the wine. Um, letting that wine guide us to what's what style. Um, and we have a few vineyard blocks. We, there's about eight different Chambersen blocks we work with across several growers. Um, there's a couple that actually do ripen really well for red wine making. So those still get diverted, but many others have been identified. These are blocks that really make sense for rosé production. Um, and so we've been focusing that, that effort um, with them for a number of years now. Yeah, this is, um, this is interesting. Um, the, the alcohol 12% um, Acidity 6.5 grams a liter. That's a high acid level. Really gives a freshness to it as well. But is there some sweetness here as well? And what level of sweetness have we got? Yeah, there's just a few grams per liter residual here. Um, you know, not much, just enough to kind of round up out, but you get some fruit sweetness. So there's really only a you know only a couple grams of residual there. So um, not significant, but um, you know, just does show through with a little bit of the fruit sweetness. But again, that acid kind of driving. So yeah. yeah. So it's the, that fruit sweetness that's really given that impression of generosity. So really, really effective. And also the price point, 12 bucks. That's fantastic. Um, really, really nice wine. And yeah, I, guess, I think that, that, that's one of the neat things, I guess, about that variety is um, it's a little bit more economical uh, to produce, um, you know, from a grower standpoint. Um, the yield per acre is a little higher. The number of sprays required, you know, uh, and uh, is lower. So um, to bring us clean fruit. And so that does make it a little bit, um, you know, more competitive for us to to bring that wine forward to, you know, kind of a broader audience with this wine as well. Mm. And um, I've noticed there are a couple of questions that maybe I can throw out. Um, let me just find them in the chats. Um, so the the first question was um, in such a cool area, and I'm not sure who this was addressed to because um, it came in, I didn't spot it immediately, but I guess all, all of you are working in relatively cool areas. Um, is it hard to get malolactic fermentation going or do you also have to heat the winery? And the, there was a second part to that question, which was does having indigenous yeasts help with also having malolactic bacteria? So if you do a wild yeast ferment, does that make doing malolactic fermentation easier? So two parts to the question. So have, e have any of you got any answers to those? Um, um, I think you're on mute. Um, Ian, I think you were speaking. I saw your okay. lips moving. So that's it. That's yeah, yeah. I'm <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I can only speak to my own... Uh, experience um and and it seems like uh malolactic um you know when you don't want a wine to go through malolactic it, it wants to go through malolactic and if you want a wine to go through malolactic then you then it doesn't want to go through malolactic um so um that that being said uh warmth certainly helps um 
you know, I don't necessarily nurture an environment for malolactic to happen in these wines. I, I'm kind of, um, um, you know, philosophically just want the wine to, to be what it wants to be. So, you know, in a wine like the Chardonnay, I didn't um, do anything to prevent it from going through malolactic, but I didn't also um, try to help it go through malolactic. Um, and it does, it does seem just anecdotally to me, like wines fermented with indigenous yeast tend to go through malolactic easier. Um, I mean, that could have to do with the lower sulfur levels that I'm using too, or, you know, maybe the vessels themselves. And I'm not, not exactly sure why that is, but it's just an observation really. Yeah, I think I think I, I agree on on uh, the indigenous gist and and the ML just happening a little easier. But in the end, having the capacity to hit your winery is something you always want to have, ideally, right? Um, you, I think us our premise at Argentina is us being farmers is always the the less you touch the wines, the better, the more successful you are. And it, I think it's aligned with what Ian's saying about in minimal intervention. But in the end, not, not intervening the wines takes a lot more supervision of them uh, than, than you would think, right? You have to actually try them and, and be there for them so that you don't have to intervene, so that you can yeah. understand where they're going. And you have to let them be a little bit too. Uh, it's not always easy if you're if you're also trying to to become a brand that's recognizable in 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 the country and and send wines that are your core drivers and they need to have consistency. Um, but you try and do a little bit of both as much as you can, right? And definitely right. Agree. And there was there was one other question, um, which I'll try and paraphrase because I don't quite fully understand the, the, all the nuances in it, but um, um, it was about growing Bordeaux varieties. Um, do any of you grow Bordeaux varieties? And is it tricky given the various climates that you work in? So I'm assuming this is Bordeaux red varieties, not white varieties. Um, yeah, or I mean, we also have, I guess, Semillon Sauvignon Blanc. We, we, one of our whites is actually Semillon Sauvignon Blanc, and I think it's one of our best wines. And it's very much Bordeaux um, based how we kind of did that wine and it's very successful. So I think there, Semillon has lower yields. So nobody likes that from the economic standpoint, but it's beautiful. So we do it anyways. And uh, the red varietals, uh, they're all different. I, I, I think Long Island had this thing where they only wanted to plant Chardonnay and Merlot and I don't understand why. I don't think Merlot is the best expression of the variety you can have, it's not Long Island, but the Cab Sauvignon does great and the Cab Franc does amazingly well. Mm. And they're easy to grow, they're clean, they're good. Mm. Mario, do you grow any Bordeaux varieties or do you buy um, Bordeaux varieties from anyone? We, we do and um, the and I think the really pleasant surprise for us here along Lake Erie is actually um, there's a there's a block of Cabernet Franc that has just um, surprised me. So we have a grower um, that their fourth generation have grown juice grapes for Welch's for for you know decades and more. Um, but about 15 years ago, they started transitioning wine grape uh, vinifera production, and we have um, an amazing block of Riesling with them as well as uh, Cabernet Franc that. Has surprised me in its ability to ripen consistently and deliver just this beautiful wine that um, I wouldn't have expected in this spot. But they were um, intentional when the um, the the two brothers that started the um, the effort to diversify the farm. They're about my age. A number of years ago, they they spent a lot of time thinking about what their best sites were, and they had four or five hundred acres to choose from. And so they really did a great job, I think, of selecting that that best little um block of land on the farm and uh and showing that so i think it you know it's a, it's surprising how um uh you know i think prior to that i don't think we would thought there was maybe as much potential for some um some some of those varieties that are maybe a little challenging to produce mm. at least in this region yeah 
And obviously, I guess with Finger Lakes, the, the Cabernet Franc is one of the star red varieties, not least because it's resistant to the cold in the winter um, and, and, and produces really cracking wines. Um, but we have one, one more wine to taste. And um, this is the Sandstone Pinot Noir 2020. Um, so Ian, can you tell us about this? Sure. The um, Pinot Noir is, is a grape that I, I feel like does particularly well in our state vineyard here. Uh, we have six clones of Pinot Noir here. We have, um, I'll name them just in case anybody's curious. We have clone 23, um, one called 386, which I've never really heard of anywhere else. Um, 667, 777, um, 115, and we have some Fumard in the ground now, but we haven't um, we haven't harvested it yet. Hopefully this year we'll we'll harvest a small amount of the Pomard. Um, this um, this particular wine, it's it's all hand picked, um, and I like to do some whole cluster inclusion in the Pinot Noir fermentation. So this was about a third whole clusters. Um, it was actually fermented in a, in bins. So um, I like to crush, crush into bins, um, you know, about a third of the bin with crushed fruit and then load in about a third with whole clusters and then top it with about a third of crushed fruit. Um, again, it goes through fermentation um, spontaneously, goes through malolactic uh, spontaneously, uh, punched down twice a day, pressed off. And then for this particular wine, half of it went into a sandstone jar, um, kind of a more of a tall cylindrical sandstone. Um, and the other half went into oak barrel. Um, this this wine though is is a hundred percent sandstone. We didn't blend the um the oak and the sandstone. Um, we kind of wanted to see see how each did um, you know with that as the variable. Um, so yeah, I find that, um, kind of like Maria was saying, like keeping an eye on the wine is very important. And this, this wine in particular was really gave me headaches through the aging process. It, it would go, it would get reductive and then, um, and then kind of come out of reduction and, and, um, go back into reduction. So, you know, it was kind of one of those wines that, that gives you headaches as a winemaker, um, but I also find that those wines might be the wines that end up aging better than any other wines. And I think that's probably going to be the case with this sandstone. Um, the, um, the wine that was done in oak from the same vintage, I think was like more approachable and kind of bigger and more, more generous right out of the gate. But this one is, is leaner and um, maybe more layered and more nuanced and, and really has, has a lot more going on in the long run yeah i think i love this idea that the, the wines often carry the ghost of reduction with them so they've been reduced during the fermentation they've been difficult but then they get yeah. past that and have partly having been i mean it sounds fanciful but having been through that struggle there's this ghost of reduction she wouldn't say they're reduced but there's some extra complexity and nuance to the wine and it's had a difficult journey of elevage and I think I like that idea a lot. And I love this wine. It's fantastic. It's got this lovely okay. texture. It's fine grained. Um, it's I'm, I'm a big fan of lighter colored Pinots as well. And I like the fact this is um, not a deep, dark wine. I think that's really, um, really, it's really the essence of Pinot. And, you know, when Pinot is capable of elegance like this, why would you want it to be a big wine? You know, so that's a uh, yeah, exactly. I think if we just kind of embrace Pinot Noir for what it is here and we don't go for extraction and we just kind of, kind of, um, you know, I like my Pinot to taste like Pinot first and foremost. I just want my Pinot Noir to to smell and, and taste like like Pinot Noir. And we've had a question coming in um, and just for, for all three of you, but I'll start with you, Ian, because we're talking about a variety where there, there are some cha challenges, I guess, in terms of um, disease and um, especially in the damper seasons. Um, what's your approach to sustainability? That's what the question was. So that's for all three of you, but starting with you, do you, do you farm organically or do you we, take part of the sustainability scheme? Yeah, I mean, you know, sustainability is one of those kind of nebulous terms. And, and I think we definitely, 
do farm sustainably here, we've moved away from chemical herbicides, chemical um, insecticides. Um, you know, we do occasionally use, um, you know, non-organic um, um, fungicides and, and mildewcides. Um, and we are moving, you know, every year we, we try to work in a spray that's, you know, maybe a bio, bio spray or an organic certified spray. Um, I mean, we're not really focused on being certified anything exactly here at 680, um, but we do, I mean, we do spend a lot of time thinking about the impact that our decisions has on the environment and, and, and our children and, and our futures. Mm -hmm. Mario, what's, um, what's, um, how do the people who you buy grapes from farm? Is there a mixture? It yeah, it's a, it's a mixture, you know, conventional through to, but I think, um, you know, thinking about uh, more and more of the growers we work with are, as Ian said, it, it is a bit nebulous, but folding in elements of, of sustainable practices. And um, I think the, the one thing that I see as part of the conversation that's been beneficial is it's not mutually exclusive of, you know, uh, you know, kind of good from an environmental standpoint, but it's also, you know, good from an economic standpoint in a lot of instances. Um, and some of the varieties that we're, you know, I'll, I'll use the rosé an example, we're using chambersen, which um, if you think about, you know, the inputs per gallon produced, per ton produced, whatever it might be, it's much lower than maybe other varieties we might grow in this region that are more, you know, disease prone or challenging to grow. Um, so, so some of those are, you know, lenses that we're thinking about and uh, encouraging our growers to continually consider that uh, as well. So, um, and beyond, you know, viticulture, um, uh, you know, we're also looking at other elements in terms of our operations. Uh, more broadly, um, since we we do expand beyond wine, we do spirits and beer, and, and looking at other elements where we can be uh, more sustainable and, and conscientious of our of our impact and footprint. And Mar Maria, you you mentioned earlier that you've been looking to grow the soil fungi, and um, so I presumably you're you're quite tuned into this topic. Yeah, I think uh, I think sustainability is definitely something that's our, our part of our core. Um, we are certified sustainable and it's something that that Long Island uh, growers in Long Island have uh, pushed for. It's um, it's just, I guess, a parameter where we can kind of start, but we try and do much more than that. And as I said, we're going to towards biology and the fungi, which is something that has never been done because in the end, we're not looking to just be more sustainable or more or, or do more regenerative farming, but we're actually looking for no input. Um, I know it's, it's, it's a dream and everyone wants that, it's hard, but we're definitely looking for something that's, um, that's why I'm intrigued with the biology and the fungi because it's something that's never been done. We have to do something different to get different results. But also I think not a lot of people talks about sustainability in a different way. We, we, when we came, when we first came to Long Island, one of the things we had in the North Fork is, farm workers were like uh, rotating quite a lot. So we designed a program where, where we actually keep them all year. We give them other jobs when we don't have a lot of, a lot of jobs in the vineyard. And we and if they stay, they get a, a, a higher percentage of bonus, which is very big compared to what it's usually in the industry. And I think sustainability also comes with people and investing in people. So there's different ways of kind of looking at sustainability. Um, as Mario was saying, even packaging, I mean, I know he does cans, we're doing cans. All those things matter in terms of trying to change things and, and actually be good for not only the, the environment, for the community as well, right? Fantastic, yes. So I'm aware that we're reaching um, towards, we're kind of getting very close to the end of our time and I want to respect everyone's time who's tuned in. Um, so if any of you have any um, last minute comments or questions, now's a good time to fire them in. Really good to see the way everyone's been interacting on the chat. Um, I think that's really positive. Thank you for that. And um, yeah, nice. I've I'm I'm really enjoyed these wines. I think it's, a, it's just so lovely to see um, 
you know, when you look at these wines, there's this natural lightness and freshness, but there's no lack of flavor. And it seems to be, you know, it's, it, this isn't deliberate, but none of the wines that we've got in front of us today are over um, 13% alcohol. They're all under 13%, which is, in a modern world, is, is a really good thing. I mean, I think it's what people are looking for is freshness, lightness, but also expression of place. I think that's really desirable as well. I think we adapt to the region, not the other way around, right? Yeah. Okay, well, that's a great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to all of you for um, contributing the wines, for being so open um, and sharing so um, you know, clearly uh, and answering all these questions. Um, I think it's over to Katie now to, to wrap the session up. Yes, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, panelists. Um, and thank you, attendees, for um, as we wrapped New York State of Wine, The Elements. Um, a recording of today's webinar, as I mentioned, will be published uh, to the New York Wine and Grape Foundation YouTube channel in the next couple of days. So we'll send all of you an email with that link. And that's a wrap for the series. We've got some exciting new programming uh, for the remainder of the year. So please stay tuned um, for those updates. And in the meantime, have an excellent afternoon or evening, wherever you are, and a great rest of your weeks. Take care. <laughs>